You're now listening to episode 90 of the Real Estate CPA Podcast. Your source for all things real estate, accounting, and tax. Here we reveal our secrets that can save you thousands in taxes, streamline your accounting process, and help grow your business. Stay tuned to hear insightful interviews with industry experts, successful real estate investors, and current clients on what strategies they use to grow their business and how they steer clear of Uncle Sam. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Brandon Hall and Thomas Costello here with Scott Choppin, founder of the Urban Pacific Group of Companies, a group that specializes in the development of workforce housing. It's important to note that Scott had gained extensive experience with real estate development and project management throughout his career working with several top developers. Today, he oversees all the operations for the Urban Pacific family of companies, including business development, capital acquisition, and strategic planning. Today's episode is exciting because we discuss several topics, including why Urban Pacific focuses on developing workforce housing, the benefits of developing versus the value-add strategy, what makes Urban Pacific's development process unique, recognizing competitive advantages. We also touch on low-income housing tax credits and much more. Scott, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Would you be able to share a little bit about your background and real estate experience with our listeners? Absolutely. So I've basically been a real estate developer my entire career. Uh, never had any other career aspirations, really, from about the time I was 18. I had set my sights on, on becoming a, an entrepreneur in real estate. And I had a huge advantage in that I had family members that were in the real estate development business. My dad, Carrie, and my uncle, Mike, uh, were both real estate developers in their own right. And so basically from the time I was 18 designing, you know, what, where I would go to college, uh, went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in California, got a finance degree. Um, but most importantly, ended up working for a couple of different companies that were in my estimate, high performing companies where I could learn and particularly had people who were willing to instruct and educate and, and bring somebody who was, uh, you know, sort of junior level project manager type person, in real estate development. One of those guys, a guy named Mike Costa, who at the time ran a subsidiary of what you guys now know as KB Home. This is called Kaufman Road Multi-Housing Group, basically a real estate developer of apartment assets for that corporation that is the home building company that everybody knows. And so I, I was always seeking ways to educate myself on the real estate development business and had, you know, through a series of choices, ended up uh, forming what is now Urban Pacific Group in 2000, uh, which puts us, you know, in fact, this month, March, will be our 20th year of operation. So we're happy to be here and uh, loving the business as much as ever. Let me put it that way. That's good to hear. It's great to hear. So we understand your company, Urban Pacific, you develop workforce housing. Uh, why focus on workforce housing? Yeah, great question. We didn't always focus on workforce housing, although I will say this, um, the years that I spent working for Mike at KBMH, we were developers of new construction apartment assets that use something called the low-income housing tax credit program, or people call it LIHTC for short, Section 42, low-income housing tax credits. And that gave me a background in affordable housing and understanding families and seniors that were at or below 60% of median income. Those programs generally provide housing to those, those income categories. And then uh, I went to work after that for a company called Cirrus Regis Group specifically to get exposure to the market rate side. So just think, you know, uh, straight ahead, luxury apartment assets, but again, you know, focus on new construction. That's really been our focus the entire time. And so when I started Urban Pacific, we were at the time focused and really are in a way on urban infill assets, right? In 2000, you know, urban infill, downtown loft housing, you know, living in the central city wasn't really a popular move. But for us, we had the luxury of having access to some very high-level thinkers. A guy named Bob Gardner at Robert Charles Lesser uh, and Company at the time was very, very enthusiastic about urban housing projects in the residential domain, be it apartments or for sale housing. And in 2000, again, that was anathema. We, though, me, we're like, you know, this is exciting. We want to be doing this. So fast forward over the years that we ran the business, uh, we've always focused on urban infill. But in the last three years, we've now come to a place where we think the middle income and our model of middle income workforce housing, 
really is meeting a social need for middle-income families that are being ever lowered in the food chain of housing, and it's vastly undersupplied. And so we think that story is a great long-term story and also, you know, a space that we can be exceptionally competitive, not a lot of fellow competitors, which is a market that we love. It's a niche, you know, maybe a contrarian move you might describe, but it's also become mainstream. Workforce housing as a concept is now much more talked about in the mainstream media, cities, employers, uh, even the employees themselves are now realizing that there's a space between luxury, high-end housing, and true affordable, right? These families that we serve make too much money. They're overqualified income-wise to be in true affordable housing, yet they may not choose to live in downtown Austin, you know, as an example, because the housing type's not coherent or, you know, it's just too expensive for them. So we're meeting this middle-income workforce housing model, you know, directly. So why choose to develop assets rather than buy like, a, like existing assets? Great question. So, you know, value add, as you guys are, you know, probably in your other interviews and for your own work, I mean, value add multifamily is the highest demand asset in the United States. I don't think there's any question about that. Read any report, Marcus Millichap, C.B. Richard Ellis. But two things come out of that. In fact, I'm writing an article right now to differentiate value add and and new construction workforce housing. So there's a few key differences that I really focus on and why we think that for us, the story of new construction. So one is value add workforce housing adds no new assets to the marketplace, right? And so we're based in California. California is in a deeply undersupplied condition across all income categories, across all asset types in the residential rental markets. And so our mind is like, this is a good story to be adding new units to a marketplace that's so undersupplied that the pricing has gone you know, wild, right? Way up comparatively, right? So adding new units is one. Two is when you buy value add, right? If you think about it, you're only ever going to be able to meet the market demand with the asset that you bought and the physical mix that you bought, the style of unit, the location, right? So if you have all one bedrooms in a value add asset that you buy, you know, maybe you could combine two one bedrooms into a two bedroom. And some people do that. But I think if you just look at generally, you are like buying that asset with the physical condition that's in, then you'll improve it, but the mix won't ever change generally, right? You'll always have an older asset. And so in our mind, if we're going to attract investment capital and use our own capital and projects, and because we're very oriented around long-term 10-year-plus holds, we go, why not better deliver a brand new asset into a marketplace, adding new housing, we're now able to design exactly what we want, right? So if we don't want to do all one bedrooms, we want to do some other mix to better fit the market and the future of a market that we are building in, then we as a developer can choose that design, that mix, that program, right, if you will. And then I think there's some other just operational characteristics, you know, even though value add assets will upgrade, I think some will upgrade systems, some won't, right? I think the less you dig into a value-add asset in the rehabilitation process, the better, right? Usually makes the numbers as long as you can achieve the rent bumps that you want. Uh, When we complete an asset, we have a brand new building, right? So we can even look forward to at least a few years of very low maintenance needs, very low maintenance costs, right? So you're just starting with the best possible brand new asset that you could engender. So those three are functionally really important for us. And the last one is we're just differentiating ourselves, guys. We're, you know, we're like any other investor or developer, really developer, uh, that we are, you know, main part of my business is going out into the marketplace, attracting capital to our projects and delivering a superior performance relative to our competition in the investment space, right? Where investors will put their capital. I want to be able to differentiate and I can, you know, even the three things I spoke about or what I speak to investors about, right? If they can get comfortable with the development model, maybe they're not used to it. They've never done that, but we can bridge that space and say, Hey, if you can get comfortable with this and you see us as a sponsor that's capable in that space, we can deliver these advantages in spades. And we think that's a real differentiator. So it sounds like when you acquire like existing assets, you're kind of limited in the value that you can add at the end of the day. I mean, you, there's definitely ways to add value, but overall, you're going to be limited versus going and developing a new asset. That's right. You've got it's an open or 
What is yes, the word I'm looking like for? It's like a clean slate. The clean word. slate. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, you've got a clean right. slate, so you can yeah. you can really add a ton of value there. And then you just mentioned superior yields too. Mm-hmm. So is development driving better yields than value add multifamily? It should, although every deal is different, right? And I say it should because fundamentally, if you look at them, if you sort of take away the specifics of a deal, like, hey, I got a institutional grade asset in Nashville versus California. So if you just sort of looking at them equally, not, you know, comparing, you know, market neighborhood characteristics, which you always would, but in this case, for this example, um, you know, development is a higher risk endeavor, right? You do have functionally things that you have to undertake, like heavier construction, right? You may have an, well, you will have, or you may have an underutilized asset or an empty piece of land. And this is functionally when we talk to value out investors. In fact, one of the questions I always ask is what is somebody's experience as an investor in value add multifamily investing versus new construction multifamily investing? And I ask that because I want to understand their background. Because when I start to have the conversation with them about new construction there are fundamentally such huge differences in the risk profile and what you have to execute on that I find a lot of people are, they get lost, not lost, but they determine for themselves that the risk is not worth what the additional return should be. And so let me give you some examples of this differential, right? So one of the things is you're buying raw land or an underutilized asset that you're probably going to demolish and then you're going to build a brand new building, right? So that brings into play zoning right? And deeper plan check and design CD construction drawing process, right? And the way that we mitigate that is just by experience and and strategic knowledge in the space. So I'll give you an example in our UTH or urban townhouse model. Right now, we're only acquiring assets that have sites that are zoned already for the use that we need to build, which is a three-story townhouse product, let's say 25 to the acre, right? Garage on the ground floor, five bedroom, four bath, which we can talk about later. So we're only going to buy sites that are already zoned. We're not going to go through a rezone in California. That's a particularly challenging process. In fact, I would say it's probably the most challenging state in the United States for that. So we say we know it really well how to do entitlements. We just choose not to do it. Right, we'll only acquire assets now. You know, there's stories for sites. Hey, maybe this one only requires design review, and you know, they're going to get into colors and material choices. You know, that kind of stuff we'll deal with. But if it's a heavy lift, the way I describe it internally, you know, big general plan amendment rezone, site plan review, where we're going to have neighbors coming to the planning commission to be, you know, upset at planning commissioners, city council people. We just pass. We just say we're not even going to engage on that. Right. So that's one way to mitigate risk. Another one is basically you just have a a heavier duty construction process, right? You're basically taking a raw piece of dirt and you're building the entire building, right? All the way from, you know, beginning to end, which, you know, a lot of people aren't used to or comfortable with. A good value add asset should move you away from structural issues. Maybe you have lighter mechanical, electrical plumbing system upgrades, and then you're doing, you know, paint, carpet, amenities, you know, common area, landscaping, curb appeal, right? Those, that last set of items are going to be an easier construction process. It's not hard, or at least in my world, to, you know, strip out old cabinets and put new cabinets in, right? You know, the tradesmen, the subcontractors that you would need for that are, you know, less critical. I mean, you still got to get them to perform, right? And have them, you know, meet the timing and the, and the standards that you need to value add correctly. But for us, you know, we're doing grading, demolition, you know, full foundations, framing, you know, full MEP, mechanical electric plumbing systems. And so the way we mitigate that, in fact, what's unique for our UTH model, urban townhouse, is that traditionally we had done a lot of like very high dense, what we call podium buildings. So this would be parking structure underneath, concrete, you know, parking podium, maybe below grade, three, four, five levels above that. And we have a lot of experience in that, but we've also learned tons of, you know, tough lessons in that space because it is complex. And my saying is complexity is the enemy of profits in real estate development. So we work to simplify. So we went to a three-story on grade townhouse model, no parking structures, no parking podiums, no below grade. It's a three-story framing, you know, undertaking. So it's, it's a, the most dense 
housing type that we can do the most simplistically or the most simply, right? In execution, uh, we, we have a production model, right? In fact, in, in my running the company for 20 years, this is the first time we've enjoyed the capability to build the same unit over and over again. Uh, we're designing different projects using the same unit type. Uh, you know, we'll do six units in this module and turn nine degrees and do four units and we'll lay a site out that, but fundamentally it's the same unit, same cabinet specs, same cabinet locations, the islands in the same place, the, you know, all the plugs are in the same place. We're using the same HVAC. So that removes the complexity. And again, I never say it's simple. It's just simplification, right? And then we use the same subs over and over again. So we're really true production, right? We're just cranking these units out. And they're, they're nice units, so don't get me wrong. But our risk mitigation is to basically, you know, execute the same process and set of practices over and over again. And then, you know, I think the, the last one that I would say is fundamentally a difference between value add and, and new construction is you have a, a non-cash flowing asset. In fact, you're going to have a non-cash flowing asset for probably two or three years, and that point usually is where I, where in my conversations, I will usually lose most investors who aren't interested in orienting around development or new construction as they're like, wow, really? You know, when I buy a value add, at least I have, you know, some occupancy and maybe it's low, right? If you're buying a distressed asset, you have low occupancy, you know, you're going to try to fix that, but it's usually not zero income. In fact, my argument, not, not even an argument, the truth of development is that you're going to be putting money out you're going to be funding capital, debt funds, equity funds for a two-year period before you ever see a dime come in. And I think that's just such a fundamental difference. And you know, how do we mitigate that? We've been doing it for a long time. And not to say that history is the ultimate determiner of knowledge and capability and execution in a space, but all the things that I described earlier, you know, buying land that's already zoned simplifying the construction process, taking on less complex, more simple build types, right? All those are to add up to better execution times and simpler execution, which fundamentally firms up the fact that you can go faster through this non-cash flow period time. And then, you know, we have to, of course, make powerful assessments about the marketplace, right? Rent comparables, operating expenses, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so kind of what I heard in there is you look to simplify the process whenever possible, you know, starting in the beginning of it, you're only going into assets that already have that are already zoned. So you're bypassing the entire zoning process and all the complexities that I imagine and, and pain points that come with that. Right. Uh, and then you're, you basically have a really good system in place and a really good process, if you will, to how you're going to ultimately build each of these, build each of these properties. And you're kind of yeah. building on the success you've already done. And that's how through this process this is how you mitigate the risk that comes with development. It's inherent. And with Correct. Yeah. Really, you, you know, you could just say fundamentally, it's a production housing production process that's built from the ground up, designed from the ground up to execute quickly and with less complexity. That's the way I would describe it. And by the way, I'm like, we're not the first to do this. Like if you look at home builders, you know, your KB homes of the world, your Beezers, your Tolls, your Lennars, their home building model is that. In fact, that's the best representation of that process. It's just, that's the less common in the multifamily development space, right? Particularly if you go into urban locations, you know, downtown LA, Dallas, Austin, back east, you know, these podium buildings are what is the correct choice for a, like a central business district close into the downtown location. But those podium buildings are always generally one-off buildings. You only ever build that plan one time because that site configured your building design in a way it's a triangular site versus a rectangular versus a square. You're always going to have to fit within the parameters of that, you know, probably great downtown Austin site, right? I don't, making complaints about the location, but now because of that location's characteristics and its site layout, you're going to build a building to maximize that particular site where we come into it the different way, which is we want to maximize the site, of course, like any developer would, but we maximize it with our townhome unit, you know, and modules of those townhome units. What's like a key unique aspect of your development process that makes your company, your development's more successful than say like a peer developer or a competitor? Yeah, great question. So I think that the practices that I described earlier about speed of execution and high level practices, I think that's 
common in the business. So really where we differentiate and what makes our deals more successful is the actual, what are we building, right? And so you heard me describe earlier, this urban townhouse or UTH model, right? And so what we've done is we've created this innovation of pairing workforce housing rental product with private capital. Really, if I were to say fundamentally, what is our innovation? It is serving that middle income, you know, moderate family space in between the true affordable and the luxury, right? Multifamily. And the way that we're doing that is basically we're building a five bedroom, four bath townhouse unit, a uh, two car garage on the ground floor, and we're making it multi-generational. So one of those bedroom bathrooms is on the ground floor. So in a family, our tenant demographic, our tenant avatar really is a large working class family. Let's say that's six to eight people, two to four wage earners usually will have an older in-law, grandma, grandpa, right? And they live this way functionally already. We're just now giving them a new unit type to live in. It would be similar to a house, right? In fact, I say ours are purpose-built to rent, you know, purpose designed to rent, but they live like a house, right? So the townhouse is three stories of you know, your own unit above and below you, right? So differentiating from a stack flat where you got a family above you who you may or may not know, you got a family below you. The joke I use, you know, if, if kids are jumping on the bed in our units, they're my kids, <laughs> right? And I can go tell them, they, you know, be quiet. And so I think that has a lifestyle, a configuration physically that has it in much more enjoyed like a house, right? But we price it, to be just below or even maybe equal to the bottom end of the house comparables that are renting in a marketplace that we would be in. It, yet we're competitive, we're brand new. We may even be you know, $100 or $200 per month below that. So that's really the differentiator to answer your question is that we're building an uncommon product, right? We're building for large families. We're building to be price coherent with uh, these working class families that have multiple incomes. And these families are, you know, they're going to pull down between, I'm going to give you California numbers versus other markets that we're looking at, like Texas. But in California, you'd have a family that makes, you know, 80 to 140,000 a year, right? Now, when I say 140, people go, oh, wow, that's a lot of money, right? I'm hearing, you know, average income is 30K or 50K in a market. The difference is the housing type, the five bedroom, four bath allows these family groups to live in one unit together right? And they share incomes and expenses across the family group. And what I say, guys, is we don't create that. We didn't bring a family together that wasn't already together. They live this way naturally. And in fact, we find globally in other cultures, living multi-generationally is the common way. And living, you know, in the standard sort of nuclear family that we're used to in the United States, although that's changing, that doesn't give the capacity to have these two to four wage earners. So if you think about it, if you know, four people have jobs and they make 30K a piece, any one of those 30K wage earners doesn't afford a new unit by themselves. But all of a sudden, when they combine these incomes, now they're in a different game or a different state of their lifestyle where they can afford a three or 3,500 or 4,000 a month rent, which in many markets, people go, wow, 4,000, that's really big. Yeah, except you're getting five bedrooms. You're getting four bathrooms. You're getting a two-car direct private access garage. You know, you're getting your own house in essence. It's attached with other houses, of course, but this is the real differentiator for us. And this is what, when we need to describe UTH or urban townhouse, this is what we need. I love that, man. You, you, it's music to my ears. Uh, everything you're just talking about is great. So we, we talk about that too at our firm, just mm -hmm. what, what makes us different than other CPA firms? Well, one of our core competitive advantages is just being virtual. And you wouldn't normally think that being a virtual CPA firm is like, you know, anybody can replicate that, right? But then when you really start thinking about it, it's, well, no, because then you have to change how you hold your employees accountable, right? right. You can't just hold them accountable to showing up at the office. Now it has to be results-based. How do you mm -hmm. do that? What systems do you build out to be yeah. And yeah. You start to find that you like kind of dig into this. And I'm sure it's the same with you, right? Like anybody listening is, oh, I could go start a development company that focuses yeah. on work. But could you really? But could you really? And right. it's just, yeah, well, I I, yeah it's really you're right. Great. When you just figure all the working parts out and now all of a sudden you're one, you're one thing that seems surface level, like, oh, I can do that. So, well, wait a second. You get into it and right. realize, no, I can't. This is a lot well, and, and, a, and a couple of things to response. And I, I totally love what you're saying. In, in fact, it brings forth for me, you know, there's a terminology I use called marginal utility. In fact, I learned with a, a group in the Bay Area called the Aji Network, and they taught me this. So marginal utility is 
what do you have in your company and your company's offer? And same for me and my company's offer that differentiates you from your competitors that has real value for your customers or your clientele or your tenants or your investors in our case that says, Hey, I look at this and this is just better enough that that will attract me to buy or attract me to pay a premium in the marketplace. So for you guys, it's being virtual, right? By the way, and you keep costs down by doing that, right? You're not running traditional office space. Our marginal utility is that we can build brand new assets. So like, let's say from an investor standpoint, what's the margin utility for Civic's UTH offer? We can deliver brand new assets in infill, close in urban communities, close to job centers, close to transit, right? Close to where these families already live, where it's very difficult in California to deliver new assets in these neighborhoods, right? Politically, entitlement wise, even functionally or underwriting wise, you know, if you had to go do a big podium building in some low or lower middle income neighborhoods where you would love to have new housing, you know, nobody else has that. It doesn't work. It's not feasible. So we're sort of pairing up this differentiator of new housing in urban infill markets and also our margin utilities. We're renting to families that have these two to four wage earners. And our claim and our research supports the fact that in a recessionary environment, These families, they stick together. I mean, they do that naturally, right? They're already culturally, you know, doing that, you know, income and expense sharing thing I was describing. But if I'm going to claim marginal utility for my investors, and I do, then I say, when you own this asset with us as an investor, and and we we stay in them long-term too, right? We're not selling these assets. We want to stay long-term. We believe in it so much that these families, you know, they batten down the hatches in a recessionary environment. And so... If I say we're at the end of our longest expansion in the economic cycle in U.S. history and we look forward to a recession, I don't say we want one, but we're also like, you know, preparing like everybody is. And we have an asset that's going to be stable and defensive in that downturn. Then, you know, in 10 years, when we go to decide whether we sell this thing or keep it, we've ridden through the recession, right? The valuation may have adjusted because cap rates adjusted, But we had stable, what I call sticky tenants, right? They batten down the hatches, they stay local, you know, their kids are in school, their jobs close by, their extended families close by. They're not moving to, you know, back home like a Gen Z or millennial. And nothing wrong with that choice for a millennial to move home or Gen Z, like my kids are Gen Z. That's perfectly coherent where they are in their life cycle. It's just say, I want to rent to families that are going to be here, that they are local, like hyper local, and they don't ever want to leave if they can help it. And I can help them do that. I can help them be sticky and stay with their extended family because I'm now providing them a unit that spreads the cost of their housing amongst these multiple wage earners, right? By having more bedrooms and and bathrooms. So that margin utility concept is so powerful in people I learn with and I speak to. Everybody should be looking at their offers that way. What can I be doing to differentiate, right? And I call it margin utility and you you might call it competitive advantage, You might call it differentiators, right? There's different ways to describe the distinction, but in all reality, you know, we're in the most global hyper-competitive marketplace we've ever been in, you know, in history. And for somebody like you guys working virtually, you know, you're now competing on a global stage, right? There's people in overseas markets that can claim to do accounting and claim to be CPAs and they're not licensed locally. So there's that thing, but we're in a new era, guys. In fact, I'm calling it, or people I work with call it the fourth industrial revolution, IR4. And so we now need to compete in a different way. And so UTH is just you know, our design of that competitive stance and marginal utility in the real estate development space. Tom, what do you think our marginal utility is? In my opinion, it's, it's proactive tax planning. It's something that uh, you know I do. Well, I've stepped into a little bit of sales here at the firm and something that everybody tells me without fail on their phone calls that they're tax professionals, they're tax preparers. They don't do any planning, no strategic advice. It's just, they fill in the numbers and that's it. You know, that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, a lot of the tax savings comes not from filling out the form. Yeah. You need to fill out the form. It's a requirement, obviously, if you're in business, but it's it's really, what can you do from it? What actions can you really take at the end of the day to uh, impact that, that ultimate form? So basically, what strategies can you implement to reduce your tax bills? Right. I think that's something that that we bring to the table that a lot of firms, frankly, just are, are not bringing. Yeah. See, I want to go even deeper there because I would say you're right. That's the, in my opinion, I think that's the symptom of what our actual 
marginal utility is, right? So I would say that because we are virtual, we get to niche in just real estate. We're not setting up shop locally here in you know Raleigh, North Carolina, and just hoping that everybody that drives by is a real yeah. estate investor, right? We get to we get to market nationally and we get to take on clients nationally right. because we're virtual. We're using technology that enables us to do mm-hmm. that seamlessly and easily. And because we're virtual, we get to hire talent all over the United States. So we get to focus on the best talent, not who's the best in Raleigh, North Carolina, right. which allows us to be proactive, which allows us to become experts at real estate because it's all we do. Mm-hmm. We see situations from all over the country and internationally, as, as mentioned, Scott. So I think that... I think that you're right, that the tax planning piece is great. And I think that that's what we sell to customers at the end of the day. But I think that it's also a lot deeper than that mm-hmm. at the end of the day, too. And it's, it's really just the overall structure of how we do things allows all of these kind of interwoven parts to come together to deliver that proactive tax strategy. And by the way, guys, you can have mo- many marginal utilities. In fact, arguably, for you to be affecting and making your business most profitable, you always want to have multiple margin utilities, creating new ones all the time, right? Every 15 minutes, you may have an overarching theme like, you know, strategic advice that you give for tax planning. But I would say you're, you're working virtually while, you know, clients may not like that may not appear to them as a margin utility, but you could speak it. In fact, margin utilities more often than not are brought forth by you guys for others, right? Your clients, to say, hey, by the way, we do these things. Here's a story of what we can help you with that's outside the norm, right? But let's say, let's take the virtual employees. You can have employees anywhere. So two things show up for me is one, you can get the best employees and you might even get them more cost-effectively because Mm -hmm. you can hire that person who lives in central remote Florida, right? And they, that's where they choose to live and they're taking care of their families, but they can, you know, provide time and help to you guys to do that, you might never get that person, right? And in fact, the the terminology I use is uh, networks of convenience, right? Those around you. So you guys are in Raleigh, North Carolina. So normally old school, it would be the clients that are in those marketplaces around you and also your employees or drive time, right? Is it, you know, half an hour, hour, whatever to drive to your office and, and sit in the office, right? Versus the IR4 version of that is what I call networks of capability, right? And we don't care where you are. We care how much we pay you. It's got to be coherent with our business model, but I might find you overseas, right? And I'm just looking for the capability first because that helps me deliver a better offer to my clients. And so the computer and the internet give you the, the, the capacity to have networks of capability globally, right? Uh, we do this too. You know, we, we, Real estate, as you guys deal with your clients, I mean, real estate is always local. Generally, it's like going to be wherever that office that you start does projects. Is it in SoCal? Is it in Dallas? Right? You know, there's that hyper local characteristic. But by the way, we have a project coordinator. In fact, you know, we we have a a small team that lives in Florida that works virtually. One does project coordination. Another one helps us with social media and our and our marketing efforts. I don't care where they are. I mean, I, you know, and I know where they are and, you know, but they first were capable and willing and, you know, our offers together and the amount that we pay them were coherent with what we needed to produce. But anymore, you know, everybody's doing email and and text and maybe phone calls and, you know, Skype and Zoom. You might be, you know, two feet away and texting somebody, right? It doesn't matter where they are anyways, anymore at least. So that convenience factor is gone or Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I shouldn't say it's gone. It's diminishing rapidly and the best competitors globally are oriented around capabilities and the networks they have for that and not anything else. Mm, I love that. Yeah, we were uh, we were laughing when you said find the CPA out in the middle of nowhere, Florida, right? And, and we were laughing because that's what we've talked about internally. It's, hey, yeah. we, have, we have access to anywhere in the nation as long as they have an internet connection. Yeah. So yeah. how many of those CPAs were great? Maybe they're now stay-at-home moms, or maybe they went with their spouse somewhere to randomly nowhere, yeah. and there's no great CPA from jobs there. But they're well, I mean, think about it. For them, like let's say they engage with you guys, and there's some rural location in Central Texas, and that's you know they love their lifestyle, and you know everybody needs to produce income for their to take care of their families, right? They may 
be so much more enthusiastic because they can be part-time with you guys. They can live exactly where they want to live. You know, obviously remote work and, you know, the the Tim Ferriss, you know, sort of methodology of, you know, work lifestyle is changing that. But I'm finding the people that I engage with at this level are much happier, right? Much more enthusiastic. You know, we're able to be more coherent with their lifestyles, even just people who work part-time, right? Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, and not to, to belabor that, but I think a lot of people are still in the old modes of IR3, right? You know, the, the last industrial revolution of, you know, you, you know, FaceTime in the office. Uh, I got to see you, you know, I, I, I got to see you sit in that office if I'm though you're going to get work done. And it is a challenge to track production and execution remotely, but that's just basically requires us to set up new sets of practices, right? Mm-hmm. Actions were in together systems, you might call it that produce it. And so accomplishing objectives becomes so much more critical versus FaceTime in the office, right? I mean, anymore, yeah. I don't even care about that. I mean, you know, sometimes it is facilitating human interaction to see people. So when I meet investors, you know, I always eventually want to meet them in person. I always require a phone call up front because I want to find out what they're after. You know, what are their objectives as an investor? Maybe my offer isn't a fit for what their objectives are. And so therefore, you know, that interaction at whatever level virtually or in person is going to be critical required. I mean, we demand it, of course, yeah. require it to make sure we're a good fit for people. But, you know, it puts you in a whole new set of systems and practices. And that by itself is a differentiator. Even you guys having a willingness to engage in that design of new systems and ever new improving systems, right? And practices. That in itself is a differentiator. And there's nothing. I mean, the office is can be good, right? Like yeah. office environment can be great. It's virtual is not for everybody. That's yeah. for sure. But yeah, don't, yeah, you're right. I, I don't mean to overstate it. You know, well, I do. <laughs> In fact, I, I would love- argue. You know, your point is is well taken. In fact, human interaction that does happen becomes so much more important, right? So yeah. when you do do it, you better do it effectively, competitively, strategically, right? And that yes. could be another differentiator. If you have there a you way go. to producing margin utility for your actual physical interactions, that's a way to differentiate. I, I'll give you a quick example. So we, I have people in my networks that, that run a large restaurant company here in Southern California, and they are designing their business all around being experiential. So when people do come to eat, because of course, restaurants are the one thing you can't do virtually. I mean, yes, we have Grubhub and delivery, but people go out to eat, you know, they're going to go to a place. They got to go there physically. And so now the idea is to design these retail and restaurant locations to be experiential so that when people do go, they go, oh, wow, so cool. Yeah, I ate food, but I did this and I did that, right? And you're knocking people's socks off. That's going to cause them, you're producing more utility and want them to come back. Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we get our team together at a bare minimum, at least once per year. And for a whole week, we go like to some big, you know, mansion or a couple yeah, of right. like yeah, offsite. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. We do an offsite or an onsite, I guess, in our case. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know. We get yeah, there is no onsite to go offsite. Never is offsite. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah. To your point, whenever we get together, we're all super innovative. It's a lot of fun, mm-hmm. high energy stuff, but we always go, well, yeah, but how much of that do you actually need? At what point does it become detrimental? Yeah. I remember when I was working at the big four, I had direct reports underneath me that I was quote unquote managing. And yeah. you now they'd show up to the office at 8 a.m. and leave at five. And I was like, yeah, they're doing a great job. You know, they're building hours, whatever. Now, if Tom doesn't show up, I don't know. It's not on me. I tell Tom, I need these results. Right. And that's Tom's job is delivered. So it just changes the mindset a little bit. Well, now you're focused on, on accomplishments or reaching objectives, right? Now, exactly. now yeah. it's like, okay, that guy's sitting in his chair and the old school way of thinking that guy was there from eight to five or that person I shouldn't say guy. Yeah. Um, which, and, and what other, where, when would you ever pay a vendor for not delivering results? Well, I guess maybe a CPA. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the, when you were in the, <laughs> way, the answer would be never. I was meaning like, let's say you had an employee, right? And in the old way of thinking, you would see them in their chair from eight to five and they take yeah. their lunch and they're not gone too long. And I think in some companies, you know, you would, you, you might accept that as a, an accomplishment or an objective, but you go, when you strip that away, now you say, what did they really get done? 
that they right. complete that report. And I'm not saying it was never all FaceTime and no, you know, production of, of whatever deliverables. I'm just saying now it's purely production and, and deliverables. For our virtual workers, we have, I'm purely focused on, did you get it done? Did that report go out? Did we, yeah. did we you know, yeah. did we submit that draw to the bank? So, yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's switch back to. I've got another question here for you. I'm kind of coming all, all the way full circle back to real estate. Right. So um, this is a great conversation, by the way. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, you've got extensive experience in the real estate industry. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about some challenges you faced through multiple cycles, uh, specifically down cycles? Yeah. Maybe how you overcame those. So earlier I talked about this, you know, defensive position and a recession of our UTH model and the, and the the orientation around designing the product and the business plan to meet those potential changes comes from our background. So, you know, for me, you know, I went through the 2008 recession, you know, with this company and it taught us, you know, some hard lessons. So, you know, the orientation around execution and velocity in, you know, our production cycles of construction came right from that, right? I'll give you an example. So we used to always use general contractors, right? And you sort of, as a developer, you know, you live and die by the selection and choice and quality and, and performance of your general contractors, right? And in 2005 and 2006, if you wanted to execute on a project, it was very difficult. We were at the peak of production of housing in California and really the U.S. and that those last couple of years before the recession. So if you didn't have a deep enough network of good GCs to execute on all your projects... And you had to go find new GC relationships. And of course, everybody was busy. And so you sort of like whoever was available and was like had good bids and seemed to meet the test and the criteria and standards we have and and no one else was bidding. Then in some cases, you went down that path, right? And so what we ended up doing in many cases was managing the GC really as much as if we were managing the subs. In fact, you know, we would go out regularly on some of our sites and we go, why are there not more plumbers here? Like we should be, we should have 20 or 30 guys on this job. I see five guys, like what's the deal? And so you talk to the plumber and, you know, in our case, in this particular instance, the plumber goes, oh, well, the general contractor hasn't paid me for three months. I go, what do you mean? I paid the guy I've been paying once a month. Like, what's the deal? So when we dug into it, you know, as GCs are inclined to do, they're trading money between trades to try to, you know, manage the job. I think most have good intentions. Or, you know, worst cases are trading between projects. I don't want that, right? And so we actually brought our entire construction operation in-house. So we basically had our own project managers, uh, own superintendents, and we, we operate that way to this day. And so what I basically, when I did that and was talking to recruiters, they're like, oh, Scott, you should have a GC. You should stay with the GC. You know, you're going to shift the risk off to them. And I go... Yes, that may be on the surface how it appears, but ultimately our company is the guarantor of the construction debt, or even me personally as the principal of the company. I always own that risk. And if that guy fails, if that GC doesn't perform, of course, you know, they only do that once and then they're gone from our networks. But I go, I own that risk anyways. And so if I'm going to own that risk, then I might as well control the process of dealing directly with the subs, right? Of managing the subs directly, negotiating the contracts. If there's change orders, is it a legitimate change order? Is the scope of their contract correct? And are the plans good or bad, right? Where's the gap that caused the change order to be produced? And what I found is in many cases, I was helping GCs to negotiate with their subs anyways, because of course I cared. I didn't want to have, you know, project go badly because I was personally guaranteeing it. I would basically, we would take that on. I mean, it was, I say me, it was either myself or our team that were doing that, you know, project managers. So we've designed our entire system around basically, again, this production. In fact, I call it the home builder model, right? Which is we act in the capacity of a general contractor, we're a CM to the project, right? So we're the developer owner. Uh, we also supply construction management services, but the development LLC contracts directly with all the subs. I call it CM prime is the way I describe it. And this is, this is a known model in the business. So I'm not creating anything new. I'm just taking a more production oriented role. This is the same thing that home builders do. So your KB home they don't hire out third-party GCs. They act in that same capacity, even though they won't call themselves that. And they go direct to the subcontract markets. So, you know, we do that as a function of having seen it not work, of having to manage it ourselves anyways. 
of keeping the risk, in fact, heightening the risk because we're trying to manage through a company, a GC that didn't want to cooperate with us. So we basically cleared the decks of those old structures and, you know, are now working under this, you know, CM prime model we've been doing since 2005, almost the entire history of the company, you know, numerically in years. So I think that's an example of just the kind of things that I think answers your question, hopefully, of what are lessons that you learned historically or from a recession, bring those forward to today and how do we manage differently in that case? Great answer. Great answer. Just one more question before we, we ask our final question. Um, of course, is, uh, <laughs> question so, the question. The, so, uh, you know, you mentioned low, uh, low income housing tax credits before. Is that something that you're still seeing being done these days or is it something that you moved away from? Would you just be able to talk a little bit about that credit? Yeah. So, I mean, that program exists more robustly than it ever has. I mean, you guys are in the accounting business, so you probably at least come across the idea of it or people who even deal in that. Um, now there is a fact, you know, some of the highest performing professional colleagues and companies that I know in the industry and my networks are in that business, a close colleague or a colleague who's number one affordable housing developer in the United States and, you know, two or three years running. So it is a very robust business, but the thing I think about and why we created UTH is because, you know, if you look at that, what I call true affordable housing marketplace, and that's 60% of median income and below. Those are, that's the tenant profile. Those are always government subsidized projects, right? Low income housing tax credits, you know, community lending from whatever bank, you know, you're dealing with on construction and perm debt, right? And then usually soft money of some type from the cities. My stance on that is that's always a finite source of capital, right? We would always wish there was lots more and there's plenty of demand in those low-income housing income categories for more units to be produced. There's never enough. The limit is functionally government subsidy and government programs that finance those projects are not unlimited. So they're sort of like just capped generally, right? On the other end of the marketplace, you know, you've got your true luxury, private equity financed multifamily development projects are value add. And you could argue that that's an unlimited source of capital, at least to the extent that the market is robust to make those projects feasible. UTH sits in between those two spaces and sort of pairs up the you know, source of capital in the private equity markets with a workforce housing model. Now, it's not as deeply rent reduced or income reduced. We carry higher incomes, 80 to 120, but that is the way the model works in part. I mean, there's other variables that we need to make work as well, right? Cost efficiency as an example. But this basically brings this out of the unlimited or the cap source of capital that you have in true affordable housing, brings it to a moderate income family, right? And pairs that up with private capital. And then one last point I'll make is one of the things that's happening right now is that middle-income families are being dropped ever lower in the food chain of housing, right? Because incomes are stagnant, you know, let's say nationally average, and housing prices in most urban metros is going up, you know, that will change in a recession to some degree. But we have a very wide gap between housing prices and incomes being stagnant and housing prices generally, you know, continuing to go up at some level. So what's happening is middle income families are having to pay ever more a percentage of their income. So 30 is the standard in the business, right? That's what should be paid to have it be affordable in the context of a family's incomes, right? In California, I mean, people are paying, you know, 40, 50, 60% of income for housing alone, which means that you shrink their discretionary income to spend on other things, you know, basic necessities, food and living, but also, you know, you crimp the economy. I can't remember the stat, but somebody had the claim that in California, we've lost some percentage GDP in the California economy because people are spending so much of their income on housing that it shrinks the discretionary income that people could spend in the economy that could then have it perform at a higher level, right? And every major urban metro has this issue, you know, some are more or less. A Dallas is different than an LA, as an example. Um, so is the tax credit market still robust? Absolutely. It's, it's a permanent program. Uh, there's a lot of demand for it. It's like any market, it varies, right? Demand and, and, and supply increase and decrease over time. But we also say it's going to be forever limited. Uh, there's only so much government capacity to ever finance that. I mean, people are always looking for new ideas. But I think that the model really is figuring out a way to pair up the private capital markets with some version of affordable or workforce housing. That, to me, is where the innovation is uh, really going to come forth in the future. 
No, it makes sense. It makes a ton of sense. Uh, if our listeners wanted to, I mean, this has been an amazing conversation today. Um, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you or learn more about you or Urban Pacific, what is the best way for them to do so? I would just encourage people to go to our website, which is www.urbanpacific.com. Uh, and if you guys want to reach out to our team or myself, we have a contact page, email, our direct phone numbers are on there. You can actually contact us through the website if you'd like. Also, people can find me on social media. I'm on every you know major social media channel, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. So we have a team, the team in Florida. <laughs> Um, that manages that. So we're, we're always tracking people who reach out and, and want to engage with us and, and would love to uh, hear from people for sure. Awesome. Well, definitely appreciate you coming on again, take the time to come on and talk about development, your development process and all of that. It was, like I said, a great conversation we'll be putting out there quite shortly. Great. Thank you guys for the invite. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed the show, please find us on iTunes and leave us a review. You can also email us at contact at therealestatecpa.com with any feedback or topic suggestions. We are always taking on new clients and with the new tax laws in play, you really don't want to navigate this alone. Let us help you save money on taxes and with your accounting and CFO needs. To become a client, navigate to our client page at therealestatecpa.com and fill out a web form with as much detail about your situation as possible. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great rest of your week.